I want to talk uh, about the systems that are affecting our lives that are failing us. And by that, I mean not just infrastructure, but I also mean our political system, our economic system. And I want to argue that these are following a similar pattern of failure that enable us to both predict where failures are going to happen and then uh, also to know what to do about them. So we are all familiar with our planet, a finite um, uh, object in space. Uh, what we often don't see about our planet is that we are and have been engaged over the last 150 to 200 years in a Ponzi scheme with our planet. Uh, as we know from Bernard Madoff, Ponzi schemes are pyramid schemes in which those at the top of the pyramid exploit others in order to keep those at the top enriched. That's exactly what we've been doing since the Industrial Revolution to other species, other vulnerable populations, and to uh, resources on the planet. Now, as we know from Bernard Madoff, uh, Ponzi schemes, if they're very large, like Madoff's, nobody wants to admit to them. And so paradoxically, we don't see them because they're so big. Secondly, we know that uh, those at the top have the farthest to fall. And thirdly, we know that they fall suddenly. Madoff's scheme fell apart literally in a matter of a day or so. Now, uh, one of the characteristics in design that we call a system like that is we say it's a fracture critical system. In other words, it doesn't give any warning of its collapse. And if you were to do a section cut through this pyramid scheme that we have with the planet, you would see that at every point there's been an exponential spike in stress on it. And that's important because we are in the midst of several exponential spikes in our systems. One of the other things about this that is worrisome for all of us is that we are now off the planet with our Ponzi scheme. It now takes about one and a half planets to support the human population at its current level of consumption. Uh, if, if everyone was consuming at the level of Americans, it would take about five planets. We know that there aren't four other planets out there trailing us in space. So we are at a position where our Ponzi scheme could in fact collapse. Now to give you an idea of what a fracture critical structure is, uh, one example is the I-35W bridge here in Minneapolis, where it was a bridge where the systems, the structure was uh, highly efficient, uh, the, the parts of the, uh, the trusses were very uh, interconnected. It had all of the redundancy taken out of it and lacked resilience. And so by overstressing this bridge, as we know, on uh, August 1st, 2007, it collapsed catastrophically without warning, killing 13 people and injuring 145 others. Now the bridge that has replaced the I-35W bridge shows that the engineering and design community have learned the lessons from this. This bridge um, is uh, actually two independent bridges so that if one span was weakened, the other would uh, still stand. So it's, it's disconnected, it's not as, as interconnected, it's overbuilt, and so it has a lot of redundancy in it. Um, and uh, it has thus a lot of resilience and ability to uh, withstand uh, unexpected stress. Now, I want to take you, though, through some examples because this fracture-critical problem we have pervades our society. It's part of the Ponzi scheme I talked about. <clears throat> Another example of this uh, it, uh, were the levees around New Orleans, a fracture-critical system where a few breaks in the levees flooded large parts of the city. This is also the response, of course, to one of the um, exponential increases that I think we're all beginning to be aware of, which is that we are on a spike in the number of hydrometeorological disasters going on right now. As you can see from this graph, uh, they have really taken off since the 1960s. This follows, by the way, the graph of carbon accumulation in the atmosphere. <clears throat> now, uh, there are ways in which you can uh, respond to situations like this to modify the impact. Uh, let's take levees, for example. So in contrast to the way Americans build levees as fracture critical systems, uh, the Dutch have a polder system where they too live below sea level in many parts of the country. Uh, they uh, have about 3,000 polders. Uh, they build their levees with local materials. Uh, local communities maintain them. Kids are taught in school how to maintain the levee. They design buildings such as these houses here that expect floods to occur, so they anticipate failure. 
And when there is a failure in the levee, uh, only a small part of the landscape is affected. Um, this is a resilient strategy in the face of uh, an uh, increasing uh, amount of um, uh, hydrometeorological activity. Um, uh, but it goes beyond infrastructure, as I said at the beginning. Uh, this has been a characteristic pattern in our economy. We all saw what happened uh, with the implosion of the investment banking industry in uh, 2008 uh, when Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns very, in a very fracture critical pattern uh, fell literally in a matter of a day or two. And it should not be a surprise because when you look at the graph of both public and private debt, it's the same exponential spike that we saw with um, these other situations. And so this notion of fracture critical design, um, of a kind of Ponzi scheme way of dealing with our needs is occurring throughout um, many systems and is obviously affecting us all as the um, most recent recession certainly has. Um, and we have to be very concerned about this. Now there are of course ways to deal with this. Uh, you build resiliency back into a system by figuring out, for example, how to live with less debt. Um, colleagues of ours at Auburn University have been doing things like uh, envisioning the $20,000 house, how uh, you can actually have a very comfortable house that's less expensive than the cheapest trailer uh, for people to live in, uh, with the notion, an old notion actually, that um, people should be able to live without lots of debt uh, on, on them. And, um, and so part of my argument here is that a lot of the solutions to these fracture critical systems we've put in place are actually old solutions. They're ideas that our grandparents and great grandparents understood and that we have forgotten. And so a lot of this is reminding ourselves and remembering what we once knew. But it goes beyond economics. It includes politics. We have a fracture critical set of political systems as we've seen with Occupy Wall Street, uh, the Tea Party on the other side. Um, of the political spectrum. And these two are indications of stressing a system to the point where people take to the streets. We've certainly seen the outcome of that in Arab Spring. And uh, you begin to look at the chart and you see the same pattern. You see a increasing amount of political polarization on, on an exponential curve that interestingly enough follows along the, the spike in inequality so that pol polarization and, and economic inequality uh, follow each other. And, and so when you begin to wonder why Congress can't agree on anything, it's because they, uh, ha we have so stressed the political system to the point where it is basically failing us right now. Um, so, uh, and again, there are things that we do. One of the ways to build resiliency back into our lives is to, bring, to begin to break the scale down of our interactions and our sense of decision making in communities. Um, an architect here who I've written about, David Somola, has designed a set of compounds. This is a compound that he's designed in Duluth where uh, it's an intentional community. Five families got together, decided that they would build this community. They share uh, maintenance. Um, and when you go there, you can't really tell where one property line ends and the other one begins. And um, this is beginning to build back in something that our grandparents, great-grandparents understood, is that you need fine grains of community. You can't have the situation that we have now, the fracture critical politics in which we're autonomous individuals in a mass culture voting only um, for political leaders in such a dysfunctional system that politics and society have to work at a much finer grain with um, a much greater uh, small scale range of community. Um, this uh, notion, uh, of course, is not just in the United States, it's a global problem. Uh, we have uh, ongoing work, as do other parts of the university in Haiti. Um, of course, the concrete buildings that fell during the Port-au-Prince earthquake, killing many people, were an example of fracture critical buildings. I won't get into that here, but uh, this is also a problem in how we build our infrastructure and many buildings um, around the world. But one of the other things about uh, Haiti that our students have learned being there 
is the um, uh, results of this graph, the Gini index. A, it's a graph of inequality. Um, and uh, if the world was actually equal, um, where 50% of the population controlled 50% of the wealth, it would be moving along that dotted line at a 45 degree angle. And we have never been more unequal than we are now. And as we become more unequal, as fewer and fewer people own more and more of the wealth, you get this extremely um, skewed exponential curve. And I argue that that same exponential stress on the system is unsustainable. As unsustainable as Bernard Madoff's Ponzi scheme, as unsustainable as that I-35W bridge before it collapsed. This cannot stand. Uh, we will either have, we have sort of two choices. We either have to bend the curve back by focusing more on spreading greater economic opportunity and equality in a greater population, or if we continue to stress the global economic system, this will collapse. And unfortunately, if my hypothesis is correct and that this is fracture critical, it won't be a slow collapse. It will be sudden, and uh, one that I don't think we want to see. And so what do we do about this? Uh, I think one of the ways um, uh, I just came from a, a meeting on this notion of public interest design, where uh, de designers are working in places like Haiti. Again, this is some of the work our students and faculty have been doing in Port-au-Prince, where you begin to empower local communities to rebuild their own lives and their own communities. It's not about an expert model from those at the top of the pyramid, which includes all of us in this room. It's about engaging local communities and enabling them to uh, use the materials and the skills uh, that they have in order to, to rebuild. Now, this has affected many of our lives in this country. Uh, we built a lot of suburban uh, developments after World War II thinking that these were good investments. These turn out to be fracture critical systems because as we've learned with the pr uh, collapse in prices and again another exponential spike that we are in the process of now in a price collapse is that in suburban developments where many of the houses were nearly identical is once you had enough houses being foreclosed on, the prices of all the other houses in that development fell catastrophically to the level of the foreclosed houses. And so what we thought were good investments in post-war suburban developments turn out to be terrible investments, very vulnerable to catastrophic collapse. Um, we have colleagues such as uh, an alumnus, Ross Chapin, an architect on the West Coast, who is doing pocket uh, communities, very small-scale communities where people uh, look after each other, um, but also create a, uh, not a kind of monoculture of housing, but there's, again, a much greater diversity of housing types, um, much like we used to build our, our towns uh, several generations ago that actually are um, um, sort of um, insurance against these catastrophic failures. Uh, another fracture critical problem we all have to be aware of is population growth. Um, as we know, we have gone essentially in one lifetime from 2 billion to 7 billion people on the way to 9 billion people. Uh, this is a fracture critical problem. This is a population and a species, all of us, that is out of control. I don't think we want that to collapse. And so one of the things we have to do is to work very quickly to take the stress off that system. Uh, ways to do that including, uh, include uh, educating uh, women, uh, empowering people to get educated, um, giving people access to information, uh, all of which will uh, uh, reduce the stress on uh, such a fast-growing population. Uh, let me end with um, a point that Jeffrey West at the Santa Fe Institute has made about this. If you look at this graph, he recognizes that we are on a series of exponential spikes, which is the dotted line number one. And that if we don't do anything about it, we end up with the dotted line number two, a sudden and catastrophic fall. And so for, if he argues that the only way out of this is to innovate as fast as possible, which is the red line, which is the only way to deal with these um, um, sort of Ponzi-like situations we're in is to continually stay ahead of the curve in terms of innovation. Um, and I think that means both high-tech innovations uh, in cases like housing like this where we live much more lightly, much more modestly with a much lower impact on the planet. It also means living in denser communities where we know our neighbors, we have a lower carbon footprint, and we have less of an impact. 
And I would end by basically arguing that what this is for us is uh, the, our species needs to grow up. We are acting as if we are the uh, uh, adolescents of the species on the planet, careening into the future, absorbing resources way beyond what we should, acting as if we'll live forever as we head to a cliff. Other species know how to do this, how to survive sustainably on the planet. And I would argue that rather than think of ourselves as so intelligent, we need to recognize that we are the baby species, the adolescent species, and that the challenge we have is to very quickly become uh, the adult species of the planet if we want to stay on this globe for much longer. Thank you very much.